Thoughts of Lee Kuan Yew will be launched tomorrow. It's a book that will stir up many controversies, but as Dr. Henry Kissinger puts it, whether one agrees or not, one will learn a great deal. And it taken the senior minister all of three years to crystallize 35 years of life experience into these pages. Pages that reveal history in the making. How things happened, why they happened. We need this country from nothing, from mud flats. It is man, human skill, human effort. The inside stories behind the familiar turning points of history. I believe in merger and the unity of these two territories. Events relived as vividly as the day they came to pass. Pages that contain never been told insights to his childhood, the growing up years in Telokurao. His courtship, the romancing of his wife. and the early influences that shaped his political thinking. The memoirs have generated intense media interest, prompting many to ask... Do you see yourself as the father figure of the nation? <laughs> no, I, I see myself as the number one slave. I've been working away uh, all hours of the day and night for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Sundays, weekends, public holidays. If there's something to be done, it has to be done. You live and learn, and that's the story of my life. I just keep on learning. The senior minister in an interview with TCS. Senior Minister, welcome to our program. First off, why did you decide to publish your memoirs now? I started writing three years ago. Uh, that's 30 years after separation, when British records are open, the archives are available. So it was not just a one-sided story. I've got uh, the British the Australians, the New Zealanders, and the Americans as uh, observers and participants of the events of those years. So it's, I think, more objective. And it was not available before. It so happened I finished it this year. It took three years because it's a long period to cover. And. Uh, Slim Kim Sun of SPH said that uh, my 75th birthday was a good day to launch it. So that's that. And you wanted younger Singaporeans. He was watching it from the private sector, <coughs> wanted my reading. I gave him my view from the public sector. He agreed. We coincided. We, had a, we, we came to the same conclusion that it was getting bad. And his assessment is something that you value. Oh, yes. He's got very, very good judgment. First, he's got comprehensive understanding of economics. He made this country work. He used to teach me economics in Raffles College. Then I studied law, and he continued doing economics. He was a finance minister, and he's, he got this place going. Uh, I would say that he, he was, he's played a major role in Singapore's development. Since you talked about Raffles College as well, yes. um, could we cast your mind back to the days of Raffles College? And you described your experiences then as an initiation into politics of race and religion. And this is to be a constant thread that runs through the politics of Singapore and the region. Do you ever see the fault lines along race and religion ever being bridged in Singapore? I replied to her just now, as long as you organize 
politics a long race, how can you blur the fault lines? Oh, Senior Minister, I'm asking about Singapore. Yes, but Singapore does not live in isolation. Singapore lives in Southeast Asia. We read, we hear, we watch TV, and not just Singapore TV, you watch Malaysian TV, you can even watch Indonesian TV. And what happens in the region affects thinking and feeling in Singapore. So the fault lines is like tectonic plates where earthquakes take place. <laughs> it will never be fused. We just live with it. They were pro-communists. They were not. But they stood side by side in the fight for independence to free Singapore and Malaya from British control. This uneasy alliance began in 1954 and resulted in a victory for Lee Kuan Yew, who chose Tanjong Paga Ward as his constituency, a seat he was to hold for the next 11 general elections over a span of 33 years. In the communist eyes, Lee Kuan Yew's PAP was seen to be the most useful group to work with of all the political groups in Singapore then. But no one was more aware than he that by accepting communist support then, he was riding a tiger. Time magazine called him Shifty Lee because of his liaison with the communists. But Lee Kuan Yew knew what he was doing. During his undergraduate days in London, he had been exposed to communism. He was no stranger to their arguments. His policy was, let us meet the communists in open argument, confront them, match their lies with truth, give facts when they distort. June the 5th, 1959, Lee Kuan Yew became the Prime Minister of a self-governing Singapore. He was clear about his government's goals. Their dedication to the cause of an independent, democratic, non-communist, socialist Malaya gives them the drive that will make the machinery of government work efficiently on your behalf. But that was not what the communists within and outside the party had in mind. In the book, you also mentioned that the communist party, you call it the communist party, like the Bajau, they are doing the meetings, the Lin Qingxiang, the Feng Shui Shuang, these people are doing the meetings, or the... 在搞学运方面呢，啊，神通广大。那么人民行动党从过去的这个活动当中，他们学到了哪一方面东西？效果大吗？呃，当然，我们跟他们一起看他们的办法，一定要学他们的好处嘛。怎样动员人民？呃，号召人民，好像各种各样的运动了，呃。部长跟人民打成一片的，呃，清清除垃垃圾了，呃，在海边，呃，用体力工作鼓励人民，呃，一起劳动勤劳，那是不是共产党的办法？是。他们是学中国的办法，中国共产党学，可能苏联的共产党的办法。可是当然一定要符合，每一个社会一定要想给他符合他社会的习惯。可是你要想，现在资讯的时代，呃，一定要改变那个办法。旧的，不会吸引现在我们一代的注意。他说这个是过去的事，所以一定要配合他们现在的生活的情况。
The Chinese majority in Singapore can be divided along the lines of the English educated, Chinese educated, and the dialect speaking groups. Between them, there's always been a sense of uneasy coexistence and conflict. This is especially evident over the issues of political strife, education, and the Singapore Malaysia merger. During the colonial period, the British government left the immigrants very much alone. The Chinese took it upon themselves to raise funds for building schools, to purchase educational materials from China, as well as to recruit teachers from the mainland. Culturally, they were in a different world. As mentioned in the Chinese version of the memoirs of Li Kuan Yu, the Chinese educated had no place in the official life of the colony, which employed only English educated locals as subordinates. Discriminated against and deprived of economic opportunities, Chinese schools became the hotbed of communist sentiments. The seed of instability in the history of Singapore's political evolution was also planted. On the one hand, the Chinese were discriminated against by the colonial government. On the other hand, they were courted as an important source of potential support for the various political parties. Although SM Lee was educated in the West, he knew he needed the support of the Chinese educated and those who spoke only dialect. As he said in his memoirs, I was also convinced that if I could not harness some of these dynamic young people to our cause, to what my friends and I stood for, we would never succeed. So far, we had links only with the English educated and the Malays, who did not have the conviction or the energies to match, never mind the will, to resist the Chinese educated communists. In 1953, Nanyang University was founded by Tan Lak Sai, who made a personal contribution of $5 million. The Hokkien Clan Association provided the 550 acres of land to build the university. Chinese from Southeast Asia, from all walks of life, also came forward in response to the call for building Nanta, with monetary contributions. In 1956, Nanta was opened officially. During the colonial era, Nanta was already a thorny issue. That issue was carried over during Lee Kuan Yew's government. He knew from the start that Nanta's development would be an educational and political problem. But in the face of changing political, economic and educational landscape, Nanta saw a steady decline in its intake. In 1978, the government began pushing for plans for a joint campus. Students from Nanta began to take their lessons at the Singapore University. And two years later, the two universities merged to become the National University of Singapore. In 1981, the government set up the Nanyang Technological Institute at the Jurong campus. It became Nanyang Technological University 10 years later. So in your whole political Fun 华人文化变成他们的所以问题是马虎复杂的问题是政府怎么样分开这个两个问题你攻击他他说你攻击爱华文爱华文爱文化华人文明爱华文教育他是大问题所以结果是本来这个问题很简单可以五六年内解决
变成比较复杂。我们要花时，从一九六五到一九八一，啊，是十六年才可以解决。你是上南大的嘛？那你就了解这回事。<笑>Your book is dedicated to Mrs. Lee,、yeah. and it's very clear that she has played a very important role in your life. Could you talk a little bit about her influence? What her influence has been throughout your life?、Uh, that's another book. <laughs> yeah, I don't. If I can answer it in one sentence, if she weren't an influence in my, supposing I'd married somebody else, I might have become a different person. I mean, not that I would be a different person, but the things I would have been able to do,、uh, the kind of backdrop I would have had, family support would have been different. In your book, you also reveal a softer, surprisingly romantic side of yourself, especially <laughs> when you talk about your courtship with Mrs. Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Um, How conscious a decision was it to keep this side of himself private before this? Well, yes. Why, why should I、uh, allow my private、uh, life to become property? But I've decided at the end of the, this is once I write this book,、uh, PhD students will have, will dissect it later on. It's bound to be、uh, because. You've got to have endless flow of PhD students. They've got no other topics to dissect. They will dissect me. Well, I wanted them to know. This is why I think I am what I am. So it gives them a lead. Maybe they will confirm it. Maybe they'll say, "No, this, this was a fake. He is misleading us." Since I'm going to write this story, I think. To understand me, you got to understand the background. My backdrop. This is my family. This is how I grew up.、Uh, this is the woman I married. This is the support I had. Don't forget. If you read it, you will find that that water agreement was put into the separation agreement because. I got her to do it. Mr. Barker was not a conveyancer, so he did the separation agreement. He went down to the library, dug up the precedents, found one in the West Indies where they separated in a federation. But when I asked him to put in the water agreement, he said, "No, better get." He was a partner with the two of us, with my brother, so he knew that my wife. Could do it better than him, so my wife did that part of the water agreement. 
Were there other similar crucial documents as well, pre or after 1965, that your wife helped draft it? Yes, but they're not as crucial as this one. Usually, she cleans up my draft. I will dictate because I'm in a hurry. So I use the dictaphone. And uh, I'll tell her, clean it up. Then I will go through it. And either the, the grammar, the, the commas, the punctuations, I will accept. But where is a question of policy, of a presentation of a policy, then I put my imprint on it. Because only then will my voice come through. I never allow anybody to impose, to be voiced over, put it like that. Because I think being voiced over confuses your followers. What other areas of decision making did Mrs. Lee help you with? Well, in the family, she makes most of the decisions. Uh, children's education, she, she decided. I told her better send to a Chinese school. She went around. I'd seen the English, I knew the English schools because she was one, a product of it, and so was I. Then in my work in the 1950s, I came across the Chinese Educators Middle School Students Union. Then I went visiting the schools as part of the All-Party Commission on Chinese Education. And I could see the vitality, the vibrancy, the self-confidence of the students because they were learning and speaking and thinking and using proverbs in their own language. None of the hesitancy and lack of confidence of the English educators. So I said, send them. So she went down, had a look, satisfied herself. Wasn't a bad decision. I don't, I think, of course it worked without disadvantage because we also decided that I would speak Chinese to them at home and brush up my Chinese and keep it going. And she would speak English to them so that their English would be fluent and idiomatic. So that worked. It was an experiment then, but it worked fortunately for them. So how would you react to the description that uh, there is a uh, romantic streak in you? <laughs> we are all human beings. <laughs> If it didn't have that romantic streak, there wouldn't be the next generation. Mm -hmm. On the eve of your 75th birthday, what do you have a wish and what is your wish for Singapore? <laughs> I do not know whether if you ask me what a personal wish would be, I think, just to remain healthy and to see Singapore prosper and have a leadership and a people that's united and will triumph over their present difficulties as we did over ours. On that note, thank you very much, Senior Minister, for agreeing to appear on our program. And from all of us, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.